Hey everyone, I'm the Dungeon Coach. I wouldn't be a coach if I didn't do some post-game breakdown of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. Just started up, excited to dive into this thing. Just watched the episode and I want to break it down for you guys. How Matt Mercer started off the campaign, all the different players and their different classes, and some theories to what's really going on behind the scenes. Again, this is some fun speculation. I'd love to hear you guys down in the comments. I did a whole breakdown series already on Exandria Unlimited. I did all eight episodes. And by the time this one started, I figured I might, might as well do this one again. And I want to see if you guys like this, if this thing blows up or not or whatever, or I can stick to my doing my normal homebrew videos. So uh, it's up to you guys. We're going to break it all down here. But first, in true Critical Role fashion, a word from our sponsors. Now, in the episode, Sam sang a huge Broadway number. And trust me, y'all don't want that from me. So the sponsor of today's video is Describe.com. So I'm going to be doing an award theme, Describe.com. I'm giving it to Marisha and Liam for their next level descriptions as players in this campaign. If you watch the episode, you know I'm talking about, but basically Marisha's character had a really great description of this dark, evil way to land the killing blow on this thing. And Liam and his little flippy halfling character had a really great description of his killing blow. It'd be really easy to always give Matt Mercer in his next level descriptions these awards, but I think for players out there, these players should inspire you to level up your descriptions. And if you want to level up your descriptions too, just go to describe.com. They have thousands of professionally written text box where you can describe different things like spells, magic items, characters. They're adding new stuff every time dialogue between npcs whether you're a dungeon master trying to come up with cool descriptions or a player leveling up your own they got a bunch of stuff on there for completely free and they also have a subscription service to unlock everything and if you use code the dungeon coach you can get 10 percent off so i'm sorry you didn't get a huge broadway number out of me and if you if you do Leave a comment and maybe, maybe I'll do one. All right, back to the breakdown. Real quick before I forget, this is a spoiler warning for Campaign 3, Episode 1. It's just Episode 1. Nothing big and huge and crazy happened. Uh, you do get to see the players and who's playing the players and the different characters. And I do have some thoughts on what may or may not be going on. Some hypothetical stuff that I'm sure we'll talk about down in the comments. But of course, there's a spoiler warning. Didn't want to ruin anything. But in all honesty, if you haven't watched Critical Role in ever before, and you could watch this episode of this breakdown and then kind of decide if you want to go actually watch the episode or not because a lot of stuff you can learn. That's why I'm going to be kind of breaking down stuff of what we can learn from these episodes, good and bad, possibly. And then if you want to go watch it, you can watch the episode too. And just in case you want to jump around in this video, I got timestamps down below. If you don't care about what subclasses they are or theories about this and that, I have everything categorized into chunks of the different parts of the things I'm breaking down, whether it's gameplay theory or critical role theory. So now... Here we go. All right, speaking of descriptions, we're starting things off with Matt Mercer's description of his own campaign. I'm not gonna play the full thing for you because it was very in detailed and long and I'm, he had to have had a teleprompter because there's no way he could have pulled that out. That, that would be the equivalent of us at our own home game tables just reading off our thing. You know, He did it in a very professional way. Probably a teleprompter, okay? So don't feel bad if you can't memorize this huge long list of things. But the really cool thing to start it off is what he did right after his intro description. Here's the clip. I would like Laura and Marisha to remain at the table while the rest of you exit, if you don't mind. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even know it was coming either. Cool, 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 oh cool, shoot, cool, I guess that means me too, because cool, 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 cool. I look like a part of this whole thing. <laughs> ah, well, okay. <laughs> okay. Have fun, I love you, don't die. I love you, okay, okay. What if we die before you get here? Okay, bye. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> interesting uh, twist at the beginning there. So he had the players leave. And uh, now I would say again, I want to try and these are the type of conversations I want to have here because th they are making a great performance in a show and everything. But what does that mean for our table? What would that look like at our table? I have had players leave the room and go to a different spot. Me and one player have left the, the place where we play and came in this room and had a little conversation, right? Um, I would say for this, my guess would be the other players are probably just standing off off screen, like, and they're, they're still watching them and, and listening to it. Because I would want my players to hear what happens at the table with <laughs> with these people and their little interaction, and you get a, get a taste of who those characters are with each other. There was no secret information here. There was no secret information given between the two of them. It was all very straight up and very straightforward. But I thought this was a really cool way to give the spotlight to these two players, let them have the role play moment back and forth to set the tone for us as the viewers, for them as their own characters with themselves. And then you got to bring in Sam and Talison's character and they got to sit down and have their own little thing. He didn't make them leave the table. That would have been weird, but it was a cool, just everyone kind of coming and building out the group one by one. So he 
had pairs. That's another huge DM tip right here. I should have some sort of overlay that flies over when I get to this part. A big DM tip here is to pair your players up. A lot of times I will tell my players, if you give, if you have some sort of thing linking it, whether you're related in some way, you've known each other for a long time, you've grown up together, try and find one of the other players at the table to have a backstory with. And maybe one player A has a link with player B and player C, but B and C don't know each other. You don't have to have it be all interwoven, but have some sort of connections there where they did know each other in some way beforehand. I usually like to give my, my players a little something bonus stuff. That's a whole nother video we could talk about, but it was done very well here on Critical Role, having each of the players, two, two players are linked up, other two players are linked up and then there's three players linked up and then one random one but we'll talk about that too all right now we're going to do a class breakdown of every single player and what character that they have i think this is really interesting this was one of the main things i was interested in see what class and subclass these people picked and then what kind of personality and role play components they'd be having for the rest of this campaign and set the tone for it so they started off the campaign at level three and i'll get into it in a second uh, except for one player is level five Talk about that and some other things here. I want to build up to it. Uh, so the first person is Laura. When she is a human with the, either the telepathic feet or an aberrant mind sorcerer. I don't know which one. She has some sort of telepathic powers. So I immediately thought aberrant mind sorcerer because all that makes sense. But she is a human and could take the variant to pick up the uh, telepathic feet, which that both of those make sense. I'm interested to see where that goes because she hasn't really showed her hand per se in either one of those or it could be both i don't know uh next one is marisha she is a multi-class i love it love it um, she's a uh, a two one has to be she's a multi-class so it's a two and one and a one and one i don't know which one's which but my my guesses are she's a level two undead warlock level one shadow sorcerer would be my guess uh the shadow just makes sense that one's a big a big guess out there uh, me and my people on in my uh dungeon crew were talking about this and this is the thing that makes the most sense so level one shadow sorcerer level two undead warlock and man oh man she got some undead creepy vibes going that she's doing an amazing job of playing and it's creeping out everybody at the table too so it's really fun to watch that next up is uh oh and she's also from whitestone which i think that might be a source of that undead evil stuff there from all of the lore stuff background there talison is an earth genasi barbarian I think we got some homebrew stuff going on, guys. I think we got some homebrew. It's probably going to be there's a, a Critical Role book coming out soon, and I get early access to all the books, so stay tuned uh, for those videos. I'll probably be coming out there and diving into that. But uh, I think it's some sort of gravity barbarian. It's either a homebrew that's out there, or it's going to be in their Critical Role book, which is what I'm probably guessing. Some sort of gravity barbarian. I think that's pretty cool. Which also leads us to Sam's character, <laughs> Fresh Cut Grass. It's an automaton named Fresh Cut Grass. This could be a Warforged span to have little wheels, a little automaton, but it might be its own, its own little race stat block template thing in itself. But um, he's a cleric, but he's gotta be a homebrew something type cleric. I love it, some sort of damage sharing components going on there. And then the big curveball, the big curveball with these last three players, Liam, uh, Ashley, and Travis. I was like, all right, they're going to bring them all in. They're going to bring them all in. And then they brought in Liam, Ashley, and Robbie from Exandria Unlimited, Robbie. And they came in as the players from Exandria Unlimited. So that eight episodes uh, stint that they had of the Exandria Unlimited, where they started off and they're doing all these things, they are coming in as those characters. And I was like, oh my gosh. That's amazing. So they're coming in as level threes, uh, which is interesting because in Exandria Unlimited, they were level three. And then I think they got leveled up to level four, I think. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, but they they started off kind of low there. In, in Exandria Unlimited, they're taking on some pretty powerful stuff. I was like, man, I feel like they should be level five, six, seven, something like that. But it makes sense that this was the plan all along to bring these characters on into campaign three. So I thought that was a big curveball. My jaw dropped and everything. And then at that point, I was like, Travis, Where's Travis? And then the, the the Twitch chat was going crazy. Where's Travis? Travis, Travis, where's Travis? Oh my God. And then after the combat, into the combat came Travis and then Travis's character came, but he's also playing a character from the past, from some other uh, one shot that he had in the search for Grog or something, uh, uh, Bertrand, Bert Bertrand or whatever. Um, he is a fighter, but he's level five. So that's a really interesting, weird twist. So my speculation on that is I don't know if this is Travis's permanent character. I don't know if he's if he's going to be playing. I don't know. He came in 
uh, the off time, which we'll talk about, and that's a little weird. But this might just be a character that's meant to push these this group together and then he leaves and then maybe they find his character and he brings in a different character or maybe he doesn't play and maybe he what he's taking a step back i don't really know i don't really know i'm just speculating here 100 percent speculating and then robbie i don't think is a purpose a, a permanent and darian uh the air genasi bard college of swords bard if you didn't know um i don't i think he's a special guest it was said by critical role that he's a special guest so i don't know and then the other two players, Liam is a halfling uh, battle master and Ashley is a satyr air air fire, uh, wildfire, uh, wildfire druid. There we go. Uh, that's the big spread of all the different classes. I'm really interested to see how they all work together. And there's a bunch of different dynamics, but I think it's really cool that they have paired backstories together from starting off this whole thing. But this whole thing, as I'm watching it and Robbie comes in and then there's no Travis in here, there was no Travis for a while. <laughs> And then is Travis going to play? But then he comes in as a level five. There's a lot of weird curveballs going on here. And I'm interested to see how the whole thing plays out. Love to hear your theories down below or whatever. They Critical Role starts to release. And with every episode, we'll start to get a better idea. I have no idea. But I think it's a really cool curveball to start theorizing stuff about. And everybody's really excited about it. So I just wanted to share share my thoughts. Because personally, I think Bertrand, would, if he could stay around, Travis playing an old man, is amazing and all the stuff he's just falling asleep and doing classic old people stuff and it's really funny to watch him play it i hope he stays there and then they do what has been done before where you have one character level five the rest are level three then they'll level up to level four to level up to level six and they'll just level up a little bit faster and eventually probably around level seven or something they'll all catch up and be the same level all right now for some gameplay theory breakdown stuff and then i'll hit you with the overall campaign thoughts insight pvp insight checks where other players are insight checking other players I have a whole homebrew thing for this and another homebrew video I'm about to release uh, sometime soon here on the channel. But uh, there's a bunch of times where these new players are feeling each other out, feeling each other out. They're saying stuff and they're evaluating and they are trying to insight check each other to see if they believe what's going on. So the first time that this happened was uh, Travis's character and Laura's character, who's his wife in real life, no less. Um, uh, he was saying that he's doing all these things. He's talking this big game and all this kind of stuff. And you can kind of tell that there's a little something going on there. Uh, and then Laura's like, my, and give me an inside check, right? So here's the clip. Do you do magic? Nope. Uh, inside check. Make an inside check. <laughs> Uh, 11? Hard to read, seems to be on the uh, up and up. To be fair, I've been accused of magic by some, but um, not of the variety I think you mean. Card tricks, shit like that. You like a kid's birthday party ma magician kind of thing? I have no arcane abilities. That's kind of the interesting part here is you have these player versus player insight checks, and then uh, he didn't have uh, Travis roll anything. But there's also been times, I'm pretty sure it was in this episode, where there's an insight check and then versus a deception check. And a lot of those times, it's some of the funny above the table stuff where it's obvious and it's more for role play flavor reasons. But but there's times before, and this is then now talking about us at our tables too, where players are lying to other players. And do you have them have opposed roles? I think personally, a better way to do it is to have a certain DC that's set. I do this for NPCs as well. If an NPC is, is trying to either lie to somebody or versus not, if the player it makes an insight check of some kind, then I have a DC that's set. Because I don't, a lot of times you could roll really low and then that doesn't make sense for the character because they should be good at lying and then that feels weird. So set DCs a lot of times. And if I have players at the table who I know have some sort of sketchy something going on, I will talk with that player beforehand, be like, all right, if you're gonna lie to this, the DC for them to check into this, I would give them a number depending on what would make sense for them. You could do some math on it based on their stats and stuff. Or I could be like, uh, 16. If they ever have an insight versus you that's uh, be higher than 16, yeah, you're going to have to give give away some stuff, right? And I would kind of give some of that stuff to the players. Another another homebrew rule that I've seen before is anytime player versus player checks, if somebody wants to do any kind of check against another player, 
the, the receiving player of the check. So somebody is suspicious, somebody pickpockets, which we're getting to in a second. <laughs> that happened here too. Any person that is receiving uh, an attack or a, of some kind, whether it's an insight check or a pickpocket or something, they don't have to roll for anything, Jay, that they get to choose, right? They get to choose because it's, it's on their own onus of where they want to say this whole thing. And that stops a lot of bad PVP stuff from going on. So the player makes a check and this is how I have done it at my table before. Instead of setting this DC, I'm just throwing out different ideas here for multiple different tables that might like to have some sort of bar set but i give it to my players is all right make a make a make an insight check sure and they make an insight check and they'll say the number to the person and then that person will give them inf- give them what they feel and then that stops me from having to ask for a perception or sorry ask for a persuasion or deception check and then which one are they rolling and now they're rolling something so then the player thinks that they're maybe lying or not gets weird, right? So instead of having to roll for that, players asking for an insight check, just have that player based on that number, be a little DM for themselves and say what they kind of feel in that whole situation. Maybe somebody rolls really high and they give them a little bit of something, but they can still be able to, they don't feel naked or exposed in some way, right? That's just something that I've liked before. And that also leads me to this next clip because there was another insight check only a couple minutes later uh, between uh, Travis and Sam, where Travis is is wondering about Sam's character, Fresh Cut Grass. <laughs> He's a robot named Fresh Cut Grass. Named Fresh Cut Grass because the person who named him named them after smells that they liked. And they liked Fresh Cut Grass. So what a great name for a character. Uh, but uh, Sam uh, had a really interesting response and I, I it speaks to me, so I want to show you. Is there something that you would uh, care to uh, eat? I ate, uh, I ate some nails last night and I am fine now. So thank you for asking though. How often do you have to eat nails? Just when I need to um, just prepare myself. Um, and it's not always nails. It's whatever what, whatever I need. Mm. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Insight check. <laughs> Make an insight check. Uh, Look, at Sam. <laughs> Look at Sam. 11. Look at Sam. Whatever I need. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Insight check. <laughs> Make an insight check. Uh, no, I'm rolling. <laughs> 11. <laughs> He said, I don't even know what I'm rolling. Like, I just said I eat nails. There's this awkward moment where he's like, but what what, am I persuading him that I eat nails? Am I like, do I have to choose if I'm lying or not? Like, like I'm just saying stuff. So I feel like there's these moments that that you can just let players like there's no roles. Like, sure, you can have an insight check and they can just say whatever they feel. So there's not that awkward moment that Sam just had. Like, what am I doing? I need to eat nails. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or other pieces of metal <laughs> so i thought it was a funny moment uh, nonetheless but uh, that that moment that sam has is kind of that little gray area i wanted to talk about here and i like to talk about these breakdowns of why does he need what does he what would he even have to roll there is it a contest is it a, just let the players <laughs> say what they feel based on what that person's insight into their actions is. And to connect into the thing I said earlier, Taliesin had a moment where he pickpocketed Ashley. So player versus player, he pickpocketed her, right? So there's been some horror stories I've heard in live streams that I do, and I'm sure you guys might have horror stories too. (laughs) Let me know down in the comments of players being just jerks to each other. Now, I think this came across fine. This is a group of players that have played together for years. They're fine. It fits with Talison's character. It was a funny thing that Ashley's character even stole the thing in the first place, so (laughs) she can't even get too mad about that. But the whole player versus player thing, uh, you could have uh, it be something where you make a check against them and then they either and give the player the choice. That's that's honestly what I was saying earlier is the player has a choice of and I say a free choice of do you allow it to happen or do you want to roll for it? Right. Because a lot of times I've had I give my players anytime there's player versus player anything. I give them the complete control over it. They are the DMs in that moment because I want them to feel in control of everything. I don't want them to feel exposed or feel bad in that way because sometimes PvP interactions can get a little weird like that. Like, no, 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 stop. I don't want them to draw my face or whatever. I don't know. Um, But uh, give Ashley the opportunity of what's your call? And she could be like, no, yeah, he totally takes it. It makes sense. I'm not paying attention. He totally would take it. And then there's no role at all. Or be like, no, he doesn't take it. I'm, I'm like, this thing, I'm holding this thing. This thing's important to me. I wouldn't let this thing go. And then there's no roles needed. Or Third option, make a roll for it. Let's go. And then she can choose to have it, let the dice tell that story. So that's my, how I personally run it as a DM. Uh, and again, 
That's the whole thing about this whole conversation. I, by no way, is my way better than Matt Mercer's way. I will never say that in any way, or whoever's watching this video, you as a DM. All of us have different ways that we run different things and different dynamics of our group, because obviously, as it played out here, Talison and Ashley are fine with each other. It was a funny moment, and everything keeps going. So you, it's all, we are different as DMs. Our groups are different. Everybody's different, and that's why I wanted to share these moments of my little insights. And as I've also said, like three other methods that you can go for this, because that's my whole point here. What I love to do on this channel is give you all a bunch of different homebrew ideas that you can take and run with, make it your own. So the last big part here is the big picture campaign. Big picture campaign is this was the first episode. They started off. How did, you, did they start it off? A lot of times Dungeon Masters, it's new Dungeon Masters, first time starting a session. I just started mine about two months back. I got a whole second channel. <laughs> Links are always down in the description for it. So for me, myself, starting a new campaign is kind of nerve wracking. So let's take a big picture look back at what happened in this campaign. So they started off completely two characters of the eight characters that eventually came in here. Two characters had a little moment together. Super simple, nice little interactive role play. Next two players came in, interactive role play between just the two of them. Next three characters came in, interactive role play between the three of them. I love that. I do the same thing. Brennan Lee Mulligan does this amazingly, and that's mainly where I started to get that inspiration from. I like to have little flashback sequences that I have with just the players by themselves. And then over time with more, more players as they start to meet each other in whatever ways that they do so that they, they feel comfortable role playing their character, whether they're going to use a voice or not, what kind of demeanor their character has, give them a little chance to showcase their character individually and privately before they're thrown in with eight people in this case or four or five, however many are in your table. I love that. Travis's character. I do have some theories as, you know, each of these three groups here, the two, the two and the three, each of them were led and guided towards essentially a tavern. <laughs> um, this one location where this big battle happened at this one building, um, where each of the players were, were guided towards in some way for their own different reasons. I'm sure they were talked about beforehand and they all kind of understood. And, and as players, you should kind of understand like, all right, we need to form a group and it, it's a team effort, right? The DM doesn't want to have to force you guys to play the game together because y'all are going to be playing the game together. Um, I think Travis is an interesting curveball to where Travis's character, I'm sure Matt and has talked to Travis in some way and he could have used them to kind of wrangle them in or meet them earlier or something. Ended up all three groups ended up in the same same spot cool so the combat happened and then Travis's character rushed out so it worked out perfectly and starting a campaign off with some sort of combat is a great way to kind of bring characters together and then he had after this big combat happened and these they're fighting brooms and chairs and knives and these animated objects which is a mysterious thing leading towards and alluding towards something else something going on great thing to start off a campaign with is a mystery of some kind a simple combat that wasn't life or death it was a pretty simple combat i think one uh ash's character got wrapped up by a rug at one point not that big of a deal everything's everything was ended up being Okay, uh, but they got to showcase their powers and abilities and stuff and had a cool, successful combat to kind of like stretch their muscles and flex their abilities in some way, which was really fun. And then at the end, Travis's character was like, you guys seem very powerful and I would like to show you to my. And so Travis was a, a guarantee with Matt and Travis had some sort of um, strong connection, which is also why I think Travis might not be his character might not be a permanent character. It might be a plot device to kind of lead them towards a certain way. And then I don't know. We'll see. But um, Travis's character was uh, almost like a second little mini DM there to be like, let's go towards this person. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go towards this person, leading them to um, this NPC. I forget the name of, but it's this uh, orc figure that, that they ended the campaign with this big thing. Like, show me how you fight. And then poof, there's a combat that happened, right? So they ended the campaign with a much bigger fight. I'm interested to see that. I, I, I might have to do a breakdown on that to see what that, what that big combat's like. Uh, because anytime you have one person versus, in this case, eight people, I'm interested to see how, how Matt does that. Because that's one of the big things with uh, Dungeon Masters of one person versus a lot. I have a whole bunch of solutions that I'm going to be coming out with, posting here on the channel. I'm calling them Apex Actions. But that's a, another video for another time. So... Uh, that's the big picture of the campaign, though. You had a little little intros for each of them. They all came together. There was a little mini combat, and then one of the players, which could be a, an NPC, but in this case, it was Travis's character, led them to a location, to a quest giver, essentially, and then there's going to be a combat and then quest branches and all this kind of stuff from there. So uh, if you like what you see, share this video around. Uh, I, I don't know if you gonna want, want this to be a continuous series or not, because I got a whole bunch of different things. I want uh, a whole bunch of different ideas planned for this channel. 
and my second channel. So let me know what you guys like to see down in the comments. We'll be diving all the way through that. And until next time, stay creative. Think outside the box. Peace.